Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about the Articles of Religious Belief. I've been in some meetings recently with some well-known Baptist historians and theologians, and they talk about some of the early confessions, and yet they uh, found out they were unaware of the Articles of Religious Belief, which preceded some of the uh, other confessions of which they were aware and uh, really makes a difference as a marker in where Baptists were in uh, the turn of the century in 1918. I'd like us to focus first on the words of Jude to the church. In Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he, w he wrote some very important ancient words about the value and importance of doctrine. He said, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write and exhort you to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. For certain men who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth they are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into promiscuity and denying our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ, to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. In the early days of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, then known as uh, Baptist Bible Institute, um, there was an effort to be sure that we were conveying and communicating the, uh, the faith once delivered to the saints. Let me talk first of all about the process of creating the Articles of Religious Belief. What was the process? How did the Articles of Religious Belief come about? Well, in 1918, there was no Baptist faith and message. And uh, there were several other doctrinal statements out there. Southwestern Seminary had its uh, used the New Hampshire Confession. Uh, Southern uh, Seminary had the Abstract of Principles. But as the Baptist Bible Institute, as New Orleans Seminary was called in those days, as their trustees or board of directors met in April of 1918, they appointed a committee of the trustees along with the president uh, to draw up a statement of principles to be presented at the next meeting. And uh, after that, the uh, new faculty uh, considered drafts of a doctrinal confession by the president, Byron Hoover DeMent, and by one of the faculty members, W.E. Denham, and uh, then they, uh, after a conversation, a discussion, they referred it back to President DeMint. And then on the next day, the uh, board of directors um, uh, had a, a called meeting and, um, uh, let me get back on uh, stage here, and uh, they approved the, the new doctrinal statement and uh, the, the new uh, faculty signed it. They had a, a week-long series of meetings in that September and into early October as they launched the school. And there were some of the most uh, famous Southern Baptists who were uh, speaking in, those, in that conference. J.B. Gambrell spoke on Christianity and the making of an army. Remember, it was 1918 and uh, World War I was going on. E.Y. Mullins spoke on Baptists in the War. Uh, Mullins was president of Southern Seminary at the time. Leroy Scarborough, the president of Southwestern, spoke on an evangelistic ministry. And Byron DeMint, our first president in his inaugural address, spoke on the Bible coming into its own. And, and so uh, in... Uh, Early October, October 1st of 1918, all of the faculty who were there signed the original uh, Articles of Religious Belief. And the picture you see there is the actual signing ceremony. 
And the reason that we have Founders Day in early October is commemorating the original signing of the Articles of Religious Belief and the launch of our institution, October 1st, uh, 1918. Now, since 1918, all 397 of our faculty members who are trustee elective have signed the Articles of Religious Belief. And here is the book. It literally has the typed copy that was originally signed by Byron DeMint and, and uh, the other, the first faculty and all the faculty members since then. And, uh, and so it's been a very important part of our heritage. Well, let's talk about the persons who were associated with the, um, the signing of the articles. Uh, who were the people who were most involved? Well, uh, although the Baptist Bible Institute directors uh, asked this committee of Byron DeMint, B.E. Gray, and I.J. I. Van Ness, Van Ness was the head of the Sunday School Board or what we would call Lifeway, and all of them were, were trustees. To author this uh, doctrinal confession, I've gone to look at the letters that we have, particularly from Van Ness and DeMint, and there's no interaction about, oh, uh, we need to add this article or we need to subtract this. Uh, there's not much evidence that they uh, got that directly involved in it. So uh, the, the two people who were most involved were the faculty member, W.E. Denham Sr., and the president, Byron Hoover DeMint. W.E. Denham Sr. was on the fam uh, founding faculty of Baptist Bible Institute as an Old Testament professor. He earned a diploma from Moody Bible Institute, an M.A. degree from Tulane, and the THM and, and THD degrees from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He was a well-known conference speaker all over the Southern Baptist Convention, particularly on the topic of the Holy Spirit. He was also a pastor of churches everywhere from Chicago, Illinois, to Columbia, South Carolina, to two churches here in New Orleans, while he was here to Kansas City, Missouri, to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, to Miami, Florida. He was pastor of First Baptist Church of Miami, Florida. Um, his son, W.E. Denham Jr., was also a well-known pastor. Had to be careful in my research to see which W.E. Denham it was. Uh, but his son, W.E. Denham uh, Jr., was also a pastor of a number of significant churches. And way back in the 1960s was a significant leader fighting for civil rights in the Southern Baptist Convention a long time before it was cool. So uh, that's a, a family heritage. But W.E. Denham Sr. published um, two New Testament Bible surveys. Uh, he uh, did a, a New Testament survey and also probably best known for a book on the Holy Spirit called the Comforter. So that's uh, about um, uh, Denham. He was uh, born in South Wales in 1881. And so he was a Brit by birth. Byron Hoover DeMint was born in rural Tennessee in 1863 in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, he had memorized the Bible by, or the New Testament by the age of 17. The last thing he memorized was the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, but uh, uh, he memorized it all by 17. He wasn't baptized until 19. That's pretty tough standards, I think, but uh, uh, he was a very precocious young man. He won honors at Peabody College, now uh, Vanderbilt, and then he went to the University of Virginia where he also won honors. He was a star debater. And then he earned his Ph.D. degree from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, DeMint was also uh, a pastor, and um, uh, he served in several uh, rural churches in Tennessee and Virginia. 
and then at the 22nd and Walnut Street Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, and then at uh, the First Baptist Church in Waco, Texas, which was uh, really kind of a, a mega church of that day. Uh, he built the, the uh, was the pastor there when the building was built in, uh, uh, under his pastorate. And then he was a pastor of First Baptist Church of Greenwood, South Carolina, when he was called to be the president of New Orleans Seminary. He taught at Doyle, Doyle College and then at the religion department at Baylor that was really the prototype that was to become Southwestern Seminary, but it, it started at Baylor in Waco, and he was working with B.H. Carroll and all the founders of Southwestern Seminary. Uh, then later he went to be the uh, professor at Southern Seminary as the professor of Sunday School Pedagogy and Hebrew, which I'm going to guess he was the only guy in the history of the SBC with that title. But uh, he, he was a pioneer in Christian education and discipleship. He uh, was the first Southern Baptist professor in Christian education and uh, uh, really made a significant contribution in that area, although biblical studies was, was his uh, focused area of study. J.M. Price, the founder of the uh, Christian Education School at Southwestern Seminary, credited DeMent with giving him many insights about starting the Christian Education School. And when Price wrote the, the history of the best known people in Christian education in the Southern Baptist Convention, a book entitled Baptist Leaders in Religious Education, he had a, an, a, an entire chapter on DeMent not for his teaching and, and being a seminary president, but, but because of his contribution in Christian education. At uh, Baptist Bible Institute, uh, DeMent was a professor of New Testament and Bible doctrine. In addition to writing a large number of Sunday school lessons, DeMent authored a Life of Christ going through the New Testament and a number of articles in scholarly journals and dictionaries. For example, he wrote articles in the International Standard, Standard Bible Encyclopedia and the current edition uh, which is a, of that, which is ed edited by Jeffrey Bromley, uh, still has DeMent's articles in it. So he was uh, really one of the most highly respected and gifted scholars of his day. Uh, he had two very interesting experiences. One day when he was at uh, Baylor, he was on the same day offered three jobs. He was offered to be on a job to be on the founding faculty of Southwestern Seminary as it moved to Fort Worth. He was offered a job at Southern Seminary and he, as a professor, and he was offered the pastorate of First Baptist Church of Waco, which had been pastored by B.H. Carroll, famous Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist mega church of the day. Uh, he ended up choosing to go to First Baptist Waco. On another day, when he was pastoring in South Carolina, he was invited to become the founding president of a new college in Tennessee, Jackson, Tennessee, that we know as Union University today. He went there and uh, uh, just didn't feel the Lord leading him to do that, but on the way back on the train, he stopped off in Nashville and talked to Van Ness. And Van Ness, again, was a trustee of the newly created Baptist Bible Institute, and Van Ness was on a committee of three people to inform DeMent that he had been elected president. He didn't know that he was being considered. <laughs> uh, he didn't send in his resume. He had no idea they were considering him. But Van Ness said, you know, hey, are you going to go to the, to the school in Jackson? And he said, no. He says, great, I have good news. You know, we're, we've elected you president. So he was an immensely uh, uh, talented and gifted man. Well, what are some of the, the possible sources for the articles of religious belief? Um, 
I have looked through the language of the Articles of Religious Belief and can find no language from the major confessions that preceded it uh, that really is echoed in the Articles of Religious Belief. I even did a Google search uh, with phrases and, and tried to find those phrases anywhere else and could not find them. So uh, I, I would say from a start, I think that it's a pretty unique uh, document. Now, there are other possible sources that we could have expected. DeMent and Denham were both graduates of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and so uh, they would have known about the abstract of principles, and of course, DeMent was a faculty member there. Uh, but uh, there is very little similarity between the Articles of Religious Belief and the Abstract of Principles, and the Articles are somewhat different uh, theologically. It could be that uh, DeMent would have modeled, since DeMent somewhat modeled Baptist Bible Institute after Moody Bible Institute, that uh, the Moody Bible Institute doctrinal statement might have had an impact. So I looked at that, but I found that Moody did not write a doctrinal statement until 10 years later in 1928, and its language differs significantly from the articles. Now, as uh, DeMent went to uh, First Baptist Waco, B.H. Carroll had made the New Hampshire Confession, the official confession not only of First Baptist Waco, but also of the Waco Association. In fact, later led the, the Texas Baptist Convention uh, uh, to adopt the New Hampshire Confession. So obviously coming in as an immediate successor uh, and uh, being very familiar with B.H. Carroll, uh, Obviously, DeMent was very familiar with the New Hampshire Confession. And then as, just a few years later, uh, as, uh, as B.H. Carroll formed this new seminary out of this prototype at Baylor, uh, they adopted, 10 years before, in 1908, the New Hampshire Confession as their official Confession, And, of course, DeMent was recruited to be a part of that faculty. He was there at the prototype. So he was uh, immensely familiar with that New Hampshire Confession. Now, the New Hampshire Confession by, that was made in 1833, by 1845, it had become the predominant uh, Baptist Confession. It was approved by the Sandy Creek Association, very important association in, in North Carolina in 1845. And as you read through uh, the latter uh, half of the, of, the, um, of the 1800s, early part of the 1900s, every major church manual or Baptist book on Baptist beliefs cited the New Hampshire Confession. Um, it, it, they were aware of the more reformed Philadelphia Confession and the Abstract of Principles, but they said that, that what had the most adherence, the most acceptance, was the New Hampshire Confession. It was, in, it was printed in J. Newton Brown's Baptist Church Manual of uh, 1853, which amazingly sold over a million copies uh, in, uh, through the time. Uh, J.A. Pendleton's Baptist Church Manual of 1867, it was recommended. Edward Hickson's Standard Manual for Baptist Churches in 1890, and he had a couple of other similar books that were bestsellers. It had the New Hampshire Confession. J.M. Frost, uh, uh, Baptist Why and Why Not, had the New Hampshire Confession. And O.C.S. Wallace's What Baptists Believe in 1913, which sold 200,000 copies, uh, also recommended the New Hampshire Confession. Wallace said, it is the formula of Christian truth most commonly used as a standard in Baptist churches throughout the country to express what they believe according to the scriptures. So, you would expect maybe the, the Baptist faith, uh, and, and later the New Hampshire uh, confession became a prototype just a few years later for the Baptist Faith and Message in 1925. 
However, there is very little verbal similarity between the New Hampshire Confession and the Articles of Religious Belief, and, um, and therefore I think we can say with some assurance that the, the, um, the Articles of Religious Belief was a new and unique document that was written uh, by the early faculty of Baptist Bible Institute. There is a, a, a seminary with a similar confession, however, and that is uh, Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. It also has a doctrinal confession called the Articles of Religious Belief, and its uh, language, though not word for word, it is, it is uh, amended at various points, but much of the language echoes the NOBTS Articles of Religious Belief, and that's largely because the founding president of Mid-America Seminary, Dr. Gray Allison, was a faculty member at NOBTS, and so he, taught, he took our uh, confession with some uh, amendments and made it the confession of Mid-America Seminary. Well, what about the content of the Articles of Religious Belief? Uh, what, uh, what does it say? Well, you have in your hands a copy of the Articles, and I'll not read through it uh, very uh, much in detail. Article 1 is on the sole authority of the Scriptures, a high authority of Scripture. Uh, uh, Article 2 is, uh, is a Trinitarian statement on the triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, Article 3 is um, on Satan and sinful man. Uh, Article 4 is on Christ, God's way of atonement. Article 5 is Christ, the only Savior from sin, without whom all men are condemned. Uh, Article 6, conversion includes repentance, faith, regeneration, and justification. It had a very high view of repentance, which one of the things that Denham was particularly interested in, a very genuine repentance, not easy believism. Article 7 was on the final resurrection of all men. Article 8, a New Testament church is a body of baptized believers observing ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, Article 9 is the Lord's Day and Christian support of, of civil government. And Article 10 is Baptist loyalty to um, our, uh, distinctive Baptist doctrines, which is a unique uh, statement in all the, uh, the different Baptist doctrines and, and uh, confessions. Well, what can we say in terms of an analysis of these, of this article, of these articles of religious belief? What, how can we frame them? Well, I want to suggest three ways of analyzing them. The, and, and to do this, we have to understand what they were addressing in their day. We can't ask our questions today of a document like that. We have to understand what were they dealing with in their day. Um, there were three issues that I think were preeminent in their day, the first two more important. The first was the fundamentalist modernist controversy. And there are aspects that we'll see that, that this shows up in the articles. The second is the Baptist distinctives literature that uh, was very popular at that time. And third, I hope we're not reading back some uh, current interest into that, but the uh, Calvinist Arminian distinctions were, were at least in the background. I don't think it was in the foreground. So, let's look first at the fundamentalist modernist controversy and uh, uh, how that was impacted. In that day, at the turn of the century, uh, there was a movement toward a more, to articulate a more conservative theology in part from the Niagara Bible Conferences, there were 12 volumes written to articulate a more conservative perspective called the Fundamentals. 
and it was edited by A.C. Dixon and R.A. Torrey, and the best evangelical scholars wrote articles in it. And uh, certainly, and this was from 1910 to 1915, so any self-respecting evangelical in 1918 would be very vividly aware of the fundamentals. And uh, though this is, as I mentioned, a 12-volume work that's very, uh, very diverse, basically it affirmed five basic fundamental beliefs. Number one, biblical inspiration, authority, and inerrancy. Number two, the virgin birth of Christ. Number three, the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross. Number four, the bodily resurrection of Christ. And number five, the coming physical return of Christ. Well, I believe that the articles affirm all five of these fundamentals. First, regarding biblical inspiration and authority. In Article 1, it says, We believe that the Bible is the Word of God in the highest and fullest sense and is the unrivaled authority in determining the faith and practice of God's people that the 66 books of the Bible are divinely and uniquely inspired and that they have come down to us substantially as they were under inspiration written. So that's a very high view of the inspiration and authority of Scripture. Secondly, regarding the virgin birth of Christ, uh, Article 2 says the, the Son is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary. Third, regarding the substitutionary atonement, uh, Article 2 says that the Son, Jesus Christ, died to redeem man. And Article 4 says that way, that way to salvation is Jesus Christ whose death atoned for our sins. So clearly it is affirming the substitutionary atonement through Christ. Number uh, 4, the bodily resurrection of Christ. In Article 2 it says Jesus Christ rose from the dead to justify the believer and is now at the right hand of God as our advocate and intercessor. So again, a strong affirmation of the resurrection of Christ. And then fifth, the return of Christ in Article 2. At the time the Father keeps in his own power, he, Jesus, will return in visible, personal, and bodily form for the final overthrow of sin, the triumph of his people, and the judgment of the world. And so we have an affirmation of all five points of the five fundamentals. Now, another thing that arose, but maybe just a few years later, was the, the, the discussion of creation and evolution. Uh, but the Scopes uh, monkey trial was uh, still uh, a few years off, about uh, eight years, seven or eight years in the future. And so maybe it wasn't quite as highlighted in 1918 but the articles do affirm that God is a creator and sustainer of all things. So as you look at what would have been a classic evangelical, a conservative Christian in 1918, they affirmed all the points uh, that would have been expected. Now the second way of analyzing it is, is looking at the Baptist distinctives literature. Um, this was really important in the early 1900s as uh, Baptists began to try to articulate and distinguish their beliefs from the beliefs of other denominations. And so there was a series of books that were published that uh, tried to underscore what were distinctively Baptist beliefs. And because DeMint and the early Baptist Bible Institute faculty were very interactive, very knowledgeable with this movement, and considering that they were in New Orleans, uh, that was a very non-Baptist kind of city. Uh, one of the interesting things I came across was that a, a, uh, a Catholic uh, uh, priest was one to Christ within the first few months of Baptist Bible Institute, and he you know, everybody was mad at him, but he, he, uh, he joined and came to seminary at ba Baptist Bible Institute. So they were very aware of, of 
the distinction between Baptist beliefs and other beliefs. Now, probably this was most uh, uh, clearly articulated in the book that J.M. Frost uh, uh, edited, Baptist Why and Why Not. And Baptist Why and Why Not uh, says, why do we not believe what Presbyterians do? Why do we not believe what Wesleyans and Methodists do? Why do we not believe what... Why do we not believe... And, and, and so really distinguish Baptist beliefs from others. And then uh, that was in 1900. In 1912, uh, E.Y. Mullins, the president of Southern Seminary, wrote Baptist Beliefs. And then all those other manuals that I referred to also came out and, and, and did similar sorts of things. So there was an immense literature saying this is what Baptists believe and what separates us from other Christians. We're not mad at other Christians. We don't think uh, everybody else is going to hell, but we just think they don't uh, get everything right. So... What about the articles? Well, in the articles, there is an immense appreciation for what we would call Baptist distinctives. In uh, Article 8, describing the church, we believe that a New Testament church is a voluntary assembly or association of baptized believers in Christ. And also in Article 8, we believe there are only two church ordinances, not sacraments but ordinances baptism and the lord's supper and that a church as a democratic organization is served by only two types of officers pastors or bishops on the one hand and deacons on the other uh, does not mention elders but uh, that would have been considered similar same thing as as a pastor or bishop also in Article 8 about baptism, it said we believe that saved believers are the only scriptural objects of baptism and that immersion or dipping or burial in water and resurrection therefrom is the only scriptural act of baptism. That's the only way is by immersion. And then about the Lord's Supper, we believe that the Lord's Supper is the partaking by the church of bread and wine as a memorial of the Lord's death, not the literally becoming the bread and body, uh, the bread becoming the body of Christ, the wine becoming the blood of Christ, or even symbolic, but a memorial of the Lord's death and our expectation of his return. The bread typifies his body, the wine typifies his blood. We deny the actual presence of his body and blood in the bread and wine, which is what the Catholics all around them in New Orleans believed. But it is Article 10 that is most clearly uh, out of this Baptist distinctives literature. It is entitled, Baptist Loyalty to Distinctive Baptist Doctrines. And it says, we believe that Baptists stand for vital and distinctive truths to, to many of which other denominations do not adhere. And that we cannot compromise these truths without disloyalty to the scriptures and our Lord. Now, as you see, it went from that to say we want to cooperate with other believers as, as best we can but it said we believe that there are some things that are non-negotiables as Baptists that we don't want to lose. So certainly the articles expressed a, a, a great interest in Baptist distinctives. The third uh, way of analyzing this I'd like to do is, is dealing with the Calvinism-Arminianism discu uh, discussion. And... I think this was an issue of waning interest in 1918. It really wasn't something that was being fought uh, way back in the mid-19th century. Uh, the, a shift had begun uh, as early as, as 1845 from a more reformed perspective to a more holding the two in, in tension, being somewhere between Calvinism and Arminianism. Uh, even the, the Southern Seminary abstract of principles that sometimes thought of as a more reformed doctrinal affirmation was identified in the recent 
sesquicentennial history of Southern Seminary by one of their faculty members, Dr. Greg Wills, as a four-point document, not a five-point document. Uh, but again, the, the dominance of the New Hampshire Confession from 1845 forward uh, was a moderating uh, uh, confession that tried to kind of be somewhere in between, to find this, this middle ground. Uh, and certainly the articles do seem to represent an effort to be somewhere in the middle ground between extreme views of, of affirming both the sovereignty of God and the freedom of human beings. So, the question is, how many points of the traditional five points of, of uh, Calvinist soteriology are in the Articles of Religious Belief? Well, the answer, of course, is it depends how you count the points. And uh, 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 so let's just look. First of all, regarding total depravity, usually total depravity is seen as having four sort of sub-doctrines to make it up universal depravity, that all morally accountable people are sinners, radical depravity, that no one except Jesus even approaches uh, righteousness, third, original sin as inherited guilt, that we, all humans, are guilty of Adam's sin. They inherit uh, a, not only a sin nature, but guilt and total inability. We can do nothing to respond to God, and therefore God must do all of it for us without our necessary cooperation. Well, what do the articles say about that? Well, first of all, about universal depravity, the articles do affirm that. Article 3 affirms that all men are born in sin, and Article 5 says all men are under condemnation through personal sin. The articles also affirm radical depravity. It says that we are by nature children of wrath in Article 3. Article 5 says that we're sinners by both nature and practice. And Article 5 says our escape from condemnation comes only to those who hear and accept the gospel. So that would make you think that, yes, they're saying it is uh, from some sort of inherited nature or inherited guilt. Um, but on the other hand, there are other things that point the other way. Um, in Article 3, it says all men have been born in sin and uh, by nature children of wrath. In, in Article 4, we're born in sin, uh, uh, both nature and practice. And uh, uh, Denham himself, in some of his writings, seemed to in, uh, be affirming inherited guilt. He said persons are sinner without hope, breaking of the laws of God and his natural inheritance of sin. It may be that this statement, uh, these statements we've been quoting, anticipate the 1925 Baptist faith and message that said, whereby his, Adam's posterity, inherit a nature corrupt and in bondage to sin and are under condemnation. So, uh, again, that seems to indicate that it is affirming the view of inherited guilt. However, there are some things that point away from it. As I said, Article 4 says all men are under condemnation through personal sin. That is distinguished from any kind of sin of inheritance. It's that which is done by our own personal sin. And could it be that that phrase born in sin in Articles 3 and 4 anticipate the language of the 1925 Baptist Faith and Message and, and later repeated in the 1963 and 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, whereby his, Adam's, and posterity inherit a, a nature corrupt and in bondage to sin and are under condemnation. Now, so far, that sounds like it's inherited guilt, but it says, and as soon as they are capable of moral action, become actual transgressors. So it would seem that 
they don't become actual transgressors until, as it says here, through personal sin, through our own individual sin. So, um, the answer is ambiguous, whether the articles affirm inherited sin or guilt uh, or not. Clearly, it's saying we inherit a nature that's oriented towards sin. It's a bit ambiguous about guilt, but it seems to me that the plainest meaning uh, of the words would seem to suggest some sort of inherited guilt. Well, do the articles affirm total inability? Clearly, no. Uh, uh, Article 3 affirms the free choice and faith of man as one of the things required uh, to appropriate uh, the atonement personally. And regeneration in the articles does not precede faith or repentance, which if you have total in inability, the idea is you have to be regenerated before you can believe. But regeneration uh, is not the beginning point of salvation in the articles. It says salvation begins with conversion. And within conversion, there are three steps or aspects, and regeneration is the third. There's repentance, and then faith, and then regeneration. So, if we summarize all of that, what does the article, how are the articles in relation to total depravity? Well, it affirms universal depravity and radical depravity. I'm going to count it as affirming inherited uh, guilt or sin nature, but not total inability. So, 0.75. All right, number two, the unconditional election. The articles are very clear in, in not affirming unconditional election, but holding election and human freedom in tension. Article four puts it very clearly. The atonement becomes personally effective through, A, the foreordination and the grace of God, and B, the free choice and faith of man. It doesn't explain to us how that works out. <laughs> it just leaves it in the tension that sometimes we see in Scripture, that both of these are important. So I'm going to give it a, a point five unconditional election. It, they believe in election, but uh, there is a, a, a part of free will. The Articles and Limited Atonement. The Articles reject limited atonement. Uh, Article 6 says the blessings of salvation are made free to all by the gospel. It is the duty of all uh, to accept them by penitent and obedient faith. Nothing prevents the salvation of the greatest sinner except his own voluntary refusal to accept Jesus Christ as teacher, Savior, and Lord. So a zero there. Uh, and the irresistible grace, likewise, for the same uh, article, it, it says that uh, it's our own voluntary refusal that would uh, keep us from being saved, so it rejects irresistible grace. Uh, Denham was particularly explicit in his writings in rejecting irresistible grace. It says God did not co coerce our wills, part at least of the worth of Christianity, lies in the freedom of choice out of which our decision to serve Christ emerges. Any other method would take away all the moral worth of our action and leave us on the level of chess men on the board. And of what worth is a decision that is forced and unwilling? So, if we add all that up, uh, oh, uh, the perseverance of the saints, uh, uh, it strongly affirms... Uh, it says the life begun in regeneration is never lost, but by the grace and power of God and the faith and cooperation of the believer is constantly brought nearer to that state of perfect holiness which we will experience finally in heaven. So, when you add up the article and the five points, if it's .75 for total depravity, .5 for unconditional election, zero for limited atonement and irresistible grace, and fully affirming perseverance in the saints, that would make it about 2.25 or two and a half points. So it's trying to strike a balance somewhere in the middle. 
between these two extremes. So, what is the significance of the articles of religious belief for us today? I want us to remember four things. Number one, doctrine matters. Doctrine matters. There's a reason that even before the first student came to Baptist Bible Institute, the trustees and the initial faculty made it a, an issue of significance and importance to write out the doctrinal parameters that they would teach within. Number two, NOBTS is a, doc, is a confessional seminary. We certainly teach in all areas of knowledge, but that which we advocate is tied to a particular confession and a particular perspective that's voiced in uh, the Articles of Religious Belief and the Baptist Faith and Message. Number three, we are conservative evangelicals. The things that, that most conservative believers in that day believed are in our confession, and we affirm them even today. And number four, we are Baptist believers. We believe in distinctive Baptist beliefs and doctrines. We don't believe the same thing every other Christian believes, but as Baptists, we believe some things that have come through our heritage, not because they're historic, but because we believe they're true to what the Bible says. And so, we can join in that lineage that goes back to Jude, that we share in this common salvation with many others, but more than that, joining with him to contend for the faith at, that was delivered to the saints once for all. May God bless us as we enter into that sacred effort. Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, I thank you for the courage of the men who have come before us and the women who have framed a doctrinal confession that is a model, that, is a, that, that forms a circle within which we can live and express our faith. I thank you for their steadfastness, their contending for the faith that was delivered to them. And Lord, may we be faithful in delivering it to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.